for joining us today for this Education Writers Association National Seminar panel. Uh, this is the session on knowing and assessing students' social and emotional needs. My name is Kevin McCorry. I'm a managing editor at WHYY for several content uh, beats, including education at WHYY. Uh, I will be the moderator for today's conversation. Before we begin, a few housekeeping notes. First, a reminder, this is being recorded. Everything is on the record, chats included. If you hover over the speaker screen, you should see a button for closed captioning and live transcript. To start viewing uh, closed captioning, click the closed caption button. Uh, to view the live transcript, click live transcript and then select show subtitle. Uh, to submit a question for our speakers, please use the chat box located in the Pathable platform. You can submit questions at any point through the session and EWA Stanford will be monitoring those questions and will facilitate a Q&A towards the end of the session. And finally, if you are going to tweet about this, please use the hashtag EWA21. Uh, now let me introduce today's speakers. Uh, Julia Dumas-Wilkes is a teacher at the Great Oaks Charter School in Wilmington, Delaware. Libby Peer is the Director of Impact at Education Analytics based in Madison, Wisconsin. And Wani Gaitan is the Executive Director of Engagement Services for Dallas Independent School District in Dallas, Texas. Uh, so great to have each of you with us today. Um, Thank you. So let's get started with this conversation. Um, you know, some newcomers to the world of social and emotional learning uh, often talk about, well, what does, what does SCL look like? And we thought one way to illustrate this today would be to model what are kind of known as the three signature practices, uh, kind of best practices, a well-known well tool used by social and emotional learning specialists. Uh, so those three practices are a warm welcome, engaging practices, and then an optimistic closure, uh, all embedded in classroom lessons, pedagogy, and staff practices like meetings and professional development. So for today's warm welcome, I'd love to ask everyone in the audience to say hello in the chat, tell us your name, where you're tuning in from, why you came to the session. Uh, take a second there and, and we'll call uh, some of your responses out. And I'm not actually sure where I can see the, those chat questions, but, but uh, maybe hey, some of them. They are in the pathable. And so I can read them for you, Kevin, if you can't see them. Jennifer Chambers is here from oh, the yeah. Detroit oh, News. Yeah. You see it? Okay, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Jennifer Chambers uh, writes about K-12. How's it going, Jennifer? Uh, uh, Jean, Jeannie Lindsay from Indiana Public Broadcasting. Um, Want to talk more about how schools are addressing social emotional. We've got Ann Doss Helms from the WFAE NPR in Charlotte. Got a rep NPR, love it. Uh, Scott Gerard writing in from Caps Time, also in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, looking for ideas on how to assess what districts uh, need. So uh, great to see some real regional geographic diversity in there. Um, guess I want to open the discussion up with a question uh, for for Wani. So so your district in Dallas, Texas really has doubled down on social emotional learning as a priority for the district. I want to ask you why and what difference has that made? Yeah, hi, Kevin. Um, so social emotional learning has become a priority just and actually before COVID hit. Um, but it's become a priority because we recognize um, and our board and our leadership recognize that SEL is critical for um, for success and not only for our students but for our staff as well so we recognize um sel as being um as being one of those or as being a skill set that anyone would need in order to be successful in school in work and in life um our trustees uh, amended our policy several years back in 2016 to write SEL into policy because it has been that critical for us to focus on SEL um, across all grade levels, um, elementary through high school, all classrooms, and then also 
in our district, um, to your point earlier about the um, signature practices, also in our staff meetings. So this is work that we recognize as important for students and for adults. And what have you seen in terms of how that's affected school culture, academic performance? Yeah, so so we started with SEL implementation kind of um, with a small group first and just kind of wanted to figure out what this rollout, what Im implementation looked like. And so we um, have learned a lot from other districts that have already been implementing SEL for several years before we had. And what our biggest takeaway has been from those conversations is we have to start with the adults first. And so what we've learned is that, yeah, our adults are modeling these behaviors and students are learning more from what our adults are doing or not doing um, as opposed to what we're saying that we need to do. So when we talk about um, a, the importance of adults practicing it, it is, it is for their own wellness, but then also because we're constantly serving as role models for our students to learn from. So what we've noticed um, recently really is just the strong relationships. We've uh, facilitated or administered the Panorama SEL survey. And in that data, we saw that our students are responding positively to having supportive relationships. And so that's something that we're really proud of and something that's critical for students and staff to come to school every day and have that support so that they can be confident in the work that they're learning. Uh, Julia Dumas-Wilkes, wanna bring you into the conversation. So you're a teacher in Wilmington. Uh, how do you think about this on a, on a classroom level? How does this play out in, in your kind of day-to-day -day interactions with students? Um, thank you so much for asking. I know um, I'm a teacher, a classroom teacher, a special education teacher, and I also lead the SEL initiative at my school. It's um, actually the way that I try to describe SEL because we are always throwing more and more things at teachers, and I don't want my fellow teachers to think this is just another thing. Um, so the analogy that I use is that if I were to invite you over to my home for a meal, I may cook you um, fettuccine alfredo. That's one of my favorites. Um, so the content that I'm teaching you, my math, my science, my English, that's the, the meal itself. But the SEL, that is the plate and the utensils that I get you to um, consume that meal. So it's not something else. So the, it's not just what we do, it's how we do it. That's SEL, it's about relationships. Um, so one example is, this is a real example from my life as a teacher. One of my kiddos last week was not responding well. We are both virtual and online. He's one of my, um, well, in person and online. He's one of my online kids, was not responding well. Um, I took a moment to call home and then realized that mom had a seizure. So maybe my kiddo isn't being disrespectful but he doesn't have the words to explain how he's feeling or what's going on. So it's really taking a step back as a teacher to say, you know, there's a lot going on. Um, sadly, it took many of us schools to go through this pandemic to pause and put the humanity of our kids first. Um, so often we ask our kids to, you know, don't show their emotions and their brains are still developing. We wouldn't do that for adults. So these are skills to teach. Just wanted to have you reflect a little bit more on the on the pandemic aspect of this and, and how we've been able to see into each other's homes through this process of virtual school and of virtual work. And we have obviously seen so many people suffer through this economy and, and through this health crisis and how that has changed your, your thoughts on what it means to be a teacher and what social emotional understanding um, adds to that. Um. I, d I definitely see um, our role as teachers, and I was speaking to actually one of our social workers, is that this is a social services job, first and foremost. And yes, I, I love my content, I love teaching, but we aren't teaching little brains in boxes, we're teaching human beings. So we have to help them with everything that they're dealing with. And if we as the school can't, or that we at least should be able to refer them to where they need to be in order to get the help. Um, but social emotional learning for me is, you know, it's, it's how we do what we do because we know that neuroscience now know that um, most of the learning is actually through our emotions before we can even get to that cognitive 
you know, prefrontal cortex of the brain, our animal brain is on fire if we don't feel safe. And uh, Libby Pure, I, I do want to bring you into the conversation in a moment, but just wanted to have uh, Wani Gaitan weigh in on that same question just around how the pandemic has exacerbated um, maybe the need and also raised awareness for this issue. Yeah, of course. So, um, you know, once once we all were sent home to work from home, the need for SEL, I, I think just um, there was just a heightened awareness for the need, even though we had already been implementing SEL, had been working on developing the skill set around SEL, there was just a heightened awareness for um, the practice to, to continue just at an accelerated level. Um, parents were asking for support around, you know, how can I help my child? How can I keep my child engaged? How can I keep my child or help him or her with, um, you know, with his depression because he's not seeing his friends. He's missing his friends, missing his teachers. Um, so we um, immediately sent out resources for parents to use at home um, to help develop the skill set. We provided trainings for parents um, to access so that they could also provide these resources. But then also, it was. Um, it was eye awakening for us. Our chief of school leadership at the time said, you know what, moving forward, everyone in secondary will have advisory period. And the reason for that is, was because, you know, when, whenever everyone shifted um, to at home learning, we had, it, we may have had seven or eight teachers in the secondary classroom that were trying to connect with all 25 kids in each of their classrooms. And that was really hard for them to make that connection with 150 students, you know, and so, but it did make sense for if we would have an advisory period, that one teacher and those 25 kids that are in that advisory period could easily connect. And so this year, all of our secondary campuses and moving forward, we continue to have advisory period in all secondary classes to focus on relationship building and also to use that time to develop the skill set around um, social emotional learning. We have just learned so much from COVID. So yeah, Kevin, I could go on and on, but I'm gonna turn it back to you. Well, Libby, let's let's turn to you. So, I mean, when we think about social emotional learning, it can feel kind of squishier, right? There's not like that standardized test that will give you um, any sort of insight into academics. And obviously that can be debated as well. Uh, but how do you, from a research and, and analytics perspective, think about social and emotional learning? So it's a, it's a really good question and a really hard question. Um, the work that we've done at Education Analytics has been trying to support uh, consortia of school districts. So we work really closely with the core districts in California, which is eight of the largest um, urban school districts in the state, uh, to think about some common measures to try and assess student social and emotional learning to provide kind of a big picture of what general trends and patterns look like. Um, there's an opportunity to say, here's what's typically happening or how seventh grade girls are typically responding to questions asking about their, their growth mindset or their self-efficacy. And we see gaps um, by gender, by race, ethnicity, by uh, economic status. And there's a whole body of research about whether that's due to the items themselves or the way that we define SEL, um, but we also have pretty good evidence that there's, for instance, in middle school, a pretty substantial drop um, on average in, in girls' responses to questions asking about their self-efficacy, whether they can achieve and um, get good grades. And so it's important, you know, at all levels of the educational ecosystem to know about those kind of big picture patterns in order to help better make sense of um, more useful, formative, local, um, kind of on the ground type of measures. And in general, uh, the work that we do at EA is in a lot of different arenas, not just SEL, but also academics, things like um, kind of human capital types of questions around, you know, teacher professional development, teacher training. And in all of these different domains, 
what we tend to see is that what gets assessed gets addressed, or some people say like what gets measured gets treasured. And so in many cases, uh, a lot of the value of trying to measure SEL, even though it is squishy and it's hard and there's no one perfect tool that will tell you everything you wanna know about kids, um, but the sheer act of measuring these things, especially at a systemic level, really does seem to make a difference in communicating the priorities that you know a district or a school has to say, this is equally important important to academics. This is just like Julia was saying, it's not extra, it's part and parcel of what uh, we value and what we want to support kids in doing. So one of the challenges is it's hard to measure these things just by their nature. People have also said that about learning forever. Um, and so we could argue about the utility of like a statewide summative standardized test. It tells us some things about kids learning. Um, it doesn't tell us everything we need to know. And that's true for some of these kind of survey-based measures of students' SEL. They, they tell us some things. We have lots of research suggesting, for instance, at the school level, they can tell us kind of where those high flyers are that seem to be really knocking it out of the park and where are some of the schools that consistently seem to be struggling that might benefit from support. Um, it doesn't necessarily tell us as much granular information um, that we would need for every kind of decision, but there's other tools, uh, you know, at the classroom level, um, at the school level that can be used for those purposes. And I wanted to flag, um, came up in a conversation we had the other day that it does seem that older students specifically, you see that their interpersonal skills are kind of aligned in parallel with their academic achievements. So that's that, that was an interesting takeaway, I thought. Yeah, we have a new body of uh, research that we will be releasing a report on later this month um, in collaboration with the core district and also policy analysis for California education or PACE at Stanford University. Um, and this is actually specifically looking at a tool that was developed to measure students' well-being uh, in response to the pandemic. And um, I've seen a few people talk in the chat about kind of the buzzword of SEL. Um, I won't go too deep into the weeds on that, but uh, we worked to support the core districts in California. They also have uh, a collaborative of over 200 different local education agencies that work together to try and share best practices around data collection, analysis, and reporting. Um, and so the core district developed a well being measure that was really asking students about their personal and interpersonal well being, not so much these SEL skills and competencies, but more just how are you feeling? How are you doing? Um, and also asked about qualities of their school learning environment and their online or home learning environment. And really the goal of that measure was to understand, uh, like I said, how kids are doing, how they're feeling, specifically to be able to provide those data to teachers uh, so that at the beginning of the school year, they had that information about their students because they didn't have the luxury of meeting those kids in person on day one um, in the state of California and a lot of other places around the country. Um, and so that is a different thing than SEL. It's certainly related, um, but it's, it's a different type of question. It's a different type of information, uh, but certainly equally important and probably in the uh, kind of during the pandemic, the kinds of things that we need to know first and foremost, Julia touched on this too earlier, just like before we even get into what skills do we need to start working on? It's like, are you even ready to start thinking about learning right now? Um, and so some of the kind of high level things that we found there, um, I can just briefly share my screen. I have a few uh, slides just to make it a little bit more uh, visual. Oh, of course, I'm gonna uh, make sure here. Gosh, we gotta go into presentation mode and then. Ah. How about while you're pulling that up? Uh, yeah. Just to... Oh, okay, if you have it. Oh, go ahead. I'm just there we gonna... go, go for yep. it. I'm just gonna swap these views, okay. Hopefully you can see the full slide now, right? Okay, I'll go through these really quickly. I'm happy to answer questions that folks have offline if you wanna hear any more. And again, this report we'll, we'll talk about uh, or we'll release at the end of this month. Um, so we look in grades four through 12 and what we see is that these purple and red lines, this is asking about students' online learning environment and their personal well-being, tend to get lower as students get older. So older students are just responding uh, that they feel more negatively about their personal well-being and um, their online learning environment. Uh, and then we see this interpersonal well-being tends to improve as students get older, where they're actually saying that things as uh, students develop and, and get older, they're saying things aren't quite uh, as bad. 
uh, we were pretty surprised. There's a lot going on on the slide. I won't <laughs> kind of dive into the, the nitty gritty, but um, all of these NS stand for not significant. We were pretty surprised to see there weren't widespread differences between students who were economically disadvantaged and not economically disadvantaged and how they responded to the questions asking about these four well-being topics. Um, but we did see some differences for students who are English learners, which is a, a relatively large population in the state of California. Uh, one notable thing is on this interpersonal well-being measure, you can see these blue bars tend to be lower than those yellow bars. So English learner students are responding generally more negatively about their interpersonal well-being and their ability to connect with other people, which again is important information for teachers and school counselors and social workers and, and principals to have to know if they should be you know, paying more attention or reaching out to those particular kids for additional support in these domains. Um, we also looked at responses when students responded to these survey measures in the fall and then again in the winter. And we saw in general, things were getting a little bit worse. Those yellow bars tend to be a little bit lower than the blue bars, which is no surprise to all of us who have been experiencing kind of the pandemic dragging on. But we saw this great bright spot in this home and online learning environment across all grades. Those yellow bars started to get higher. So students are really responding to the hard work of educators, you know, at every level to get better and to learn in how they're delivering online instruction, which is just like no small task as you know, Wani and Julia can say much more authoritatively than I can. Um, and then the last thing I'll point out too is this relationship you mentioned. We see that as students get older, this interpersonal well-being measure here tends to be more related to their academic performance. So really those peer relationships become super important as students get older, just in and of themselves important as we saw just from those raw survey responses, but in terms of their ability to learn and make progress uh, as students get older, it's those interpersonal um, items that seem to be related. Whereas for younger students, it's this personal well-being and their home or online learning environment um, that are most closely related. So I know that was a bit of a fire hose of things, um, but we have the ability to look at some of these large scale patterns that again, we think can be helpful uh, in, in tandem with all of the ways that people like Julia and Wani are gathering information for their students and the students that they work with, um, not just on these types of, of topics, but the whole spectrum of things we consider SEL and culture climate. Thanks, Libby. Uh, Wani, I want to bring you back into the conversation. Um, I'm just curious, riffing on the, the buzzword uh, conversation that's happening in the ch chat, some people might say, look, you know, we've been doing this for decades, like teachers developing relationships with kids in the classroom, like that, we didn't have a fancy name for it, but we've been doing it forever. And so, okay, you're just trying to repackage some something and, and, and make it, you know, pedagogy that we all have to learn, but this just comes natural to good teachers, maybe a skeptic would say. Uh, how do you get buy-in and why do you think it's important to label it as such? Yeah, so I, th I think that that's a really important um, um, recognition that, yes, for many wonderful teachers, many wonderful teachers have been um, teaching these skills we have we now have labels for these skills right and so it's what's important is that we're calling them out so that for example when we're talking about um developing healthy relationship skills maybe th those wonderful teachers have been modeling all along when a student is talking or when you're in a conversation with someone take turns talking and listening make eye contact you know do not interrupt you know just kind of reminding them of healthy um, relationship building type practices but they're calling them out and being very intentional not everybody calls out how to develop these skills and so when we focus on social emotional learning we're we're helping um our educators educators in our trainings, reminding them to call out how to develop these skills so that students can call on the, that skill set that they're learning whenever they are not only in class, but also applying these skills to everyday life. So being very intentional about calling out the skills is critical so that we can apply these skills to experiences even outside of the classroom. And Julia, kind of, I guess, same question to you. How, how do you think about it in terms of like, is this just something you would do naturally as a teacher versus this is something that you really have to be intentional about and think about? Um, I would say maybe in years past, it was very natural for many um, teachers. Um, I would say since the shift that 
you know, when I was in school, we got tested maybe once a year, standardized tests every three years. We're now giving my, our kids four to five standardized tests every single year. So that's less time um, for these skills to be paramount. Also, I think um, we are now teaching the Generation Z. So they are, their first gadget, they're more gadget oriented. And so we have to teach these people skills more intentionally. Um, one thing I can share my screen really quickly to kind of show you um, what SEL may look like. Each state I know, well, in Delaware, um, state of Delaware, we are developing competencies and standards and bringing it down for what does it, what does self-awareness look like at the kindergarten level versus an adult? And just a reminder, these are skills for adults too. It's not just for, um, for our kiddos. So um, really quickly, I'll just give you, this is top secret. Okay, I'm working with the state, but <laughs> this is our draft. But so, you know, SEL or that's our buzzword is, and I'm okay with that. So self-awareness is one of the things that we want before you can be a good citizen. You need to know who you are, what your strengths are. So at the kindergarten level, it will look like you're able to ask for help and advocate for yourself, you know, instead of having a tantrum. Um, on the ninth grade level, does that mean, you know, you're able to analyze what effect your choices have over someone else? Or, you know, when I taught civics is, where do your rights, my rights start and my responsibilities start, you know, that whole thing. But really repackaging it. And to me, it makes everything that we teach um, important. So if you're teaching a math lesson about money, it, that's about managing your, your, your time and your money. That's a, a life skill, a social emotional skill. I want to uh, look at some, of que some questions we have heard in general from reporters. Um, you know, I'll put this to you again, Julia, like, do you, is, is there a, a big story on this that you feel like isn't being covered? Questions that reporters should be asking that they're not right now? Um, one thing I, I, I would love if uh, reporters could ask families and children, like how they're doing, what do they want from kids? Um, schools right now, we are planning for the fall, whatever that would look like, and also for the summer. So some of our, um, some people want us to rush straight through and do summer school for everyone, even though it was a pandemic, which to some seems punitive because everyone is worried about learning loss. Um, but I, I read an article recently, which is not just learning loss, it's those social and emotional skills. So I have seventh graders who haven't been to school for a year. They'll go back to school in the ninth grade. There's lots of social skills and just opportunities they miss um, due to no fault of their own and how do we kind of help ease their anxiety to bring them back into the community? How do we help them build trusting relationships with staff and teachers and with families? Um, so I, I think it's huge, but I'm, I'm very hopeful that, that we're on the right track. So anything you want to add to that, Wani? Just questions that reporters should be asking? Yeah, I think that, you know, I think, so if we could ask employers just in general, what do you look for in, um, in your employees? What are, what are those skills that you look for in employees? Probably more than likely, they're not going to go straight to the technical <laughs> skills. They'll probably express some of these skills that we're trying to develop through a focus on social emotional learning. So I think, you know, asking those questions, but then also asking how are districts using their funding sources to prioritize social and emotional learning? I think that that's something you know really important because we're all talking about it, that SEL is important, but to really, you know, put some funding support behind it in every school district to ensure that you do have staff that are available to provide teachers and families with the support. I think that those are just good questions to ask of districts. Um, and then how will we measure it? What are we looking, you know, how do we want to see, um, what do we want to see as success for implementing social emotional learning? All right, so we've been getting some uh, great questions in the chat, uh, bringing Stacia in to uh, have a conversation now with a little Q&A session. Yeah, thank you so much, Kevin, for moderating that first part of this conversation. 
I loved the warm welcome it gave me a lot of insight on some of the questions and topics that I think our reporters are, are wondering about. Um, so I'm I'm going to take some of that and formulate some questions, but um, journalists, if you have more specific questions, please go ahead and put them in the passable chat. I'm, I'm looking at those. And so, um, Wani, you just talked about, you know, one tip that you gave to reporters was look at the funds, ask about the funds and track that. How are they going to be used? And so um, Scott Gerard from the Cap Times in Madison, Wisconsin, is interested on some ideas about how to assess um, districts and uh, what they're doing with SEL. So it's one thing with funds, but then, you know, do you have any tips for how to assess what they do with those funds? Yeah, so I think that, you know, um, first you want to make sure that you have um, a staff or that you have a team or that districts have a team of support around social emotional learning to provide training. Um, and so whether you're bringing in consultants to provide training or you have um, developed staff in in house to provide that training that ongoing support to our campuses or to campuses across the country, I think that that's important that you want to see that um, the district is prioritizing training um, and development. Um, you also want to see resources. So for example, um, in Dallas, we're using the Panorama SEL survey. And so is there a way to get feedback or do we have any tools to get feedback from students on what they are expressing that their needs are? And then are there resources available to teachers to help teach those skills that students are telling us that they need? So when we talk about funds, we wanna look at, you know, what's available to the staff to equip them with the skill set to develop our student, the skill set in our students, and then um, what, you know what tools are available to measure the impact. I think those are some critical pieces to consider. And thank you. <clears throat> uh, the next question I'm gonna I'm gonna throw towards uh, Julia and um, Lily Altavena from the Detroit Free Press, and also Ashley McBride, um, who covers education at the Oakland side in Oakland, California. They both had questions about how schools were specifically looking out for vulnerable students. Um, and in addition, how in the fall school districts are going to be addressing pandemic related trauma. Um, so has your school had any of those conversations and has there been any, have there been any ideas floating around? I'll go to you first, Julia, and then Wani, if you have anything to add to that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, actually my school, so I am in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, President Biden's hometown, but my population that I serve is a charter school, 99% are black and brown students. It is a title one school. Wilmington struggles with high poverty, um, gun violence, um, lots. So I would say our entire school is in a vulnerable position. Um, we've had parents and families who have lost heat, um, lots of death, you know, due to COVID and so forth. Um, one thing that I'm actually proud of in Delaware is that our team has been focusing on SEL for a while and it's now coming to fruition, I guess, because of the pandemic, it's pushed it forward a bit. Um, so what that looks like is actually starting this year, Delaware regulations have changed and it is now required um, a, we have to track it, monitor the data and also provide curriculum for all of our students. So um, MTSS, which is multi-tiered systems of support, my uh, Juana knows, <laughs> um, one of our education acronyms. Um, so what it will basically look like going forward and actually me being a special education teacher is each student is going to have their own individualized learning plan, basically, whether or not they are a special education student. So say for instance, Juana is really good um, in English, um, but on her, um, incoming survey, she said that she is anxious or depressed. So maybe we'll put her into a small group with our counselor for kiddos who are experiencing um, anxiety. Libby um, is doing great with math, but she's struggling um, with English. We'll give her a small group for English, but she had a death in the family. So she will go to the grief um, support group. So everyone um, is going to have like tailored supports based on reading, writing, listening, speaking, behavior and social emotional learning. No, that was a lot. <laughs> and 
And Juani, do you all have any special plans in Dallas? Yeah, so um, similar to Julia, um, what Julia described, and in Dallas, we also, our social emotional learning department works closely with our mental health services and counseling services and the MTSS team. And the reason is because we feel like there are different tiers uh, for support. So social emotional learning and counseling services, MTSS, we feel like this is like the tier one. These are practices that everyone benefits from. But as we identify students that have more um, individualized needs um, for whatever their situation might be, it might, they might need more clinical support. And then we, you know, we've, um, we're working on helping teachers to identify when a student expresses um, something or when as they get to know students and they identify that a student needs additional more inten intensive support, then we can start referring them to our clinicians in our mental health services department. Um, if maybe the classroom practices and or the counseling small group guidance isn't enough and they need more intensive support, then they can get that, inten that intensive support from um, the mental health clinicians. Okay, um, I'm going to turn to Jennifer Chambers. Um, she has a question and uh, she writes, how do schools or educators measure whether these SEL measures are working? Um, how do they know that they're effective and whether or not they should be continued or changed? So I'm going to open that one up because I think you all probably have insight on that, but whoever wants to speak up. I'll jump in just to start, but Wani, I definitely want to hear your take too. I mean, it, this is really challenging, but I think really the goal is to not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I mentioned this earlier. There's not a single measure that's going to tell you, is it working? Is it not working? But starting to just try to gather information and data, even if it's qualitative information about um, teachers' perceptions or others in the school building, including students themselves, perceptions of their school culture and climate um, and how that's shifting is really valuable and is an important starting point. Like there doesn't have to be a perfect tool out there um, to be able to gather important information about whether it's working. And importantly, you know, each school, each district, their strategies are going to look different. Like some do have out of the box curricula that they start to use and implement, um, especially when those curricula have a lot of tools that make it really easy to roll them out without a ton of customized training. Uh, that'll look really different from something that's more homegrown and more aligned to, you know, a strategic plan or vision, either at the building or district level. And so I think the measures should be aligned to what is it that you're trying to implement and what's your theory of change? Like what, what do you think is going to be different? Is it really about um, improving students' perceptions of their school climate? Is it about improving students' perceptions of themselves and their own ability? Is it about, um, you know, Julia mentioned MTSS, like more early intervention to avoid things like referrals for behavioral problems or, um, you know, suspensions? I mean, all of those things look different and then the measures will be different. Like you might want to actually track suspension rates over time if one of your goals is to reduce suspension because of, um, you know, an SEL program or, or curriculum. I'd like to just add to what Libby shared. I think that all of those examples are great examples for what we want to look for whenever we are looking at data points to measure. I do think that there's also some evidence in just when you walk into a building, what does it look like? What does it feel like? How welcoming is it for a student? How safe is it for a student and staff member to work and to learn in that space? And so, you know, how engaged are um, the students and staff in a class or in a lesson? You know, how how much ownership do they take of what's going on throughout the building? And I think that gets to like the application of these skills that we're trying to develop in our students. I think there are so many data points that we can consider because SEL is embedded in everything that we do. So we will, you know, after, implement, after implementing for a few years, we'll see the gains in the academic progress. We'll see it in the climate and culture data that, you know, that schools are collecting. We'll see it in, um, in just several different data points. I think it's very important to talk to people. We, we are starting um, 
to really conduct a lot of empathy interviews, to hear from uh, staff, to hear from students, to hear from community members about what's going on. I think that it just lives, it, it lives everywhere in our, you know, in um, observable just kind of behaviors and then just in data that we're already collecting as well. I was going to add one other thing to that, and I'm curious, Julia's per perception on this too. I think there's an interesting parallel between measuring SEL and things like um, observations of teaching practice and pedagogy. For a long time, it was like, how do we know what good teaching looks like? Um, and a lot of times it was like, if you're an, an experienced educator or an experienced principal, you walk in and you kind of just know, you see it. And it's hard to, you know, numerically say this is a three out of five, but the field has moved in that direction of try in many districts and um, to really try and quantify what are those like key skills and competencies that we want to see teachers exhibit um, and bringing SEL into that as part of it. I think there's a similar kind of trend in the field that we're not there yet, but I think it's important to push ourselves collectively to try to say like, it's not impossible to try and define what these practices look like. And, you know, Wani and Julia both have touched on what some of those things are. They don't have to universally look like this or look like that, but even just the presence of having a warm welcome or a greeting uh, versus its absence is, is signal. It's not, you know, useless information. And we don't need to use that to be punitive or to rank, you know, classrooms or anything like that. But it is useful, especially from a data perspective, to be able to then correlate those things with, hey, we implemented this in all of our classrooms. And then, you know, the next year we saw these kinds of gains in academics or these kinds of gains in how students are responding about how safe they feel or how much they feel a sense of belonging. So I think pushing ourselves in a similar way, not to be afraid to try and make these things measurable, even though they're hard, uh, will have a net benefit kind of for, for everyone. So I want to, we have a few minutes left. I want to try to get to a couple more questions if we can. Um, Samantha Dowdy uh, from the Victoria Advocate um, has a question that I'm sure a lot of reporters are wondering, and that is, have we seen a connection between SEL and learning loss this year? Are there districts that prioritize, are districts that prioritize SEL seeing different learning loss than those that don't have a focus on SEL? I'm not sure if any of you know the answer um, to that. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that specifically, but I can say there is research that learning SEL skill will A, um, it improves attendance. It does improve academics, both grades and standardized tests. Um, it improves students' um, attitude towards schools and their teachers. It also decreases poverty and drug use. And those are things that are really, really big on my heart. Um, so if I have a kiddo who, let's say I have a young man who he doesn't know how to regulate his emotions. And the first thing I do is I tell him to get out of my class and go to the dean's office. He's um, a, he doesn't feel accepted. He doesn't have a good relationship with me. B, he missed out on the lesson for today. Um, and C, he still doesn't know how to regulate his emotions. So I'm gonna let this child go through the educational system, not knowing how to regulate his emotion. He's a young man, possibly one of my students, a black or brown young man who is poor and he's angry and he doesn't know how to regulate his emotions. How is he going to operate in the world? when he turns 18 and 19. You see what I mean? So these are skills, not just for school, but they are for life and for career. So if you're able to know, if I can, you know, I'm a little biased, but <laughs> if my kids know I can um, breathe or I can do these three to five things to calm or soothe myself, but they didn't get all of the algebra for the year, I think I did a good job because they can relearn the algebra. They may not be able to, um, have the opportunity to learn those skills. Um. You're mute. Stacia, you're muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I said, thank you, Julia. Um, Wani, just quickly, um, because we're almost at time, have you seen any evidence in Dallas or have, have you all been collecting data on SEL and learning loss in any way? Um, 
we don't have um I don't have the data to speak to, but I can tell you that what we um what we know is that students that have that we've had the opportunity to talk to um what they missed is that social interaction. And that's because that's how they learn by interacting with each other. And on a Zoom call, you know, it's very structured and they can't just um, engage in conversations with their teacher or with their friends the way they would um, in passing, you know, from one class to the next or, you know, um, in class and small groups. So that social interaction is what students thrive off of. And so they did miss out on that. And so um, we know that there is some learning loss. So we do have plans in place to help address the learning loss, but that social interaction is, is critical for learning. And I'm sorry, we had a couple more questions that we're not gonna be able to get to, but um, I am gonna have to close. And so um, of course, wanna thank our speakers. I feel like there was just a wealth of information here and insight and tips for our reporters. And in keeping with the three signature practices, I wanted to end on an optimistic note, that third signature practice is an optimistic closure, um, which is something developed by Castle and they, remind us that this isn't necessarily a cheery ending, um, but it rather functions to highlight a shared or individual understanding of the importance of this work. And so um, for those of you who are still here, I have a slide that I'm gonna share and I'd like for everyone in the audience to choose one of these prompts to respond to um, in the chat. Oops. Um, so either something you learned today, something you're curious about, something you're looking forward to tomorrow, something you'll do as a result of this meeting, something you still question or something that still concerns you. This is our optimistic close. And if you could quickly just respond in the chat, we'd love to hear your thoughts and reflections. And while you all are doing that, um, I'll go ahead and say my closing remarks. Um, I wanna thank again, our wonderful speakers and our moderator, Kevin, for joining us today. Um, next week, you will get an email with an evaluation form. Uh, please complete it. We take your feedback very seriously and we use it to, uh, to improve our offerings. Um, if you haven't taken a look at the schedule in at four o'clock, we have three sessions coming up. The first is what reporters need to know about state testing in 2021. Um, we have a sponsor session about uh, sponsored by the Aspen Institute about um, the last 30 years of standard based education and whether it advanced equity and academic outcomes. And then we have a session uh, featuring Red Kess and Pedro Naguera on their new co authored book left right and center where partisans disagree and agree on education. Um, so I'm just gonna check the chat real quick and just say thank you to all of you who have responded. Um, asking families and kids, direct connection between SEL and student outcomes. I hope our speakers can get a chance to look at um, all of the reflections in the chat today. Um, we are three minutes over time. So I am going to let everyone go and um, thank you again for joining us. And thank you to everyone in the audience for participating. All right, take care everyone.